I concur with uh, Loni. Uh, well, what he said, saving best for the last, <laughs> is not this presentation, is the cocktails, <laughs> which are going to follow this presentation. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks everyone for being a patient audience. I know it's been a long day uh, full of uh, very insightful presentations. Uh, I'm going to uh, pick up a few threads from uh, some of the speakers uh, who presented earlier. And uh, nothing new, it's just the way we see things that Hero has and how we try and uh, envisage the future of ATMs in light of those uh, contextual experiences. I got 30 odd minutes to cover uh, the polling agenda. Uh, so uh, the, the structure which uh, we have particularly employed to dissect this problem is, you know, the mother source of the ATMs has been cash. And cash perpetually has got distributed through branches and then the ATMs since last four decades. So these two are, are most critical infrastructure pillars as far as the cash or the understanding of the cash in the future is concerned. Of course, branches uh, is not the agenda of uh, why we are all assembled over here. So I'm going to speak about the ATMs and cash. And then there are some uh, insights, some models uh, which we feel are pertinent to Asia Pacific something which uh, Rohit spoke, uh, Nauru spoke, uh, and a couple of other uh, esteemed panelists spoke. And then I'm going to share a few collaboration stories which UNRIT uh, has done in this region. And uh, maybe that gives you some insight uh, in case you want to build your future journeys, in case you want to build your ATM challenge journeys for your respective banks. A bit about UNRIT. Uh, uh, we are a NASDAQ listed company uh, founded in 1994. Uh, we process transactions uh, upwards of 7 million in 2021 with around 8,000 employees. Uh, we serve in 150 plus countries. The company is structured in three views. Uh, the first one is transaction processing view called EFT. Under EFT, we do the transaction processing for all kinds of origination and termination channels, whether it's ATM, POS, uh, e commerce, or the new age channels like uh, real time payments, QR code payments, or any proxy payments uh, which, which world is emphasizing. Uh, one, one differentiator which UNIT has brought into the entire gambit of payment processing is in addition to the online transaction processing, we also do an end-to-end -end managed services model, which technically means the entire back office, the consideration settlement, dispute management, so on and so forth, comes under one uh, center. So it's a single uh, party accountability model which we have in Sphere Academy. And uh, how, how is this entire stack sold? Uh, we sell this as a service on a public cloud, uh, AWS, Google, uh, Alipay. Uh, we, we provide the service from our own data centers and we have uh, a couple of them in Asia Pacific. We also use the on-prem model, which means the banks or the financial institutions or any target audience can deploy this service, this software from their own data centers. Euronet also uh, runs some of the versatile payment networks, infrastructure networks globally. Uh, we we uh, run some of them in Asia Pacific also. And some total, little less than 50,000 ATMs is what Euronet manages uh, as part of its portfolio. Uh, we have also pivoted to doing a POS end-to-end managed services model. And uh, that's been the result of uh, one of our uh, acquisitions in Europe, which probably I can speak offline uh, for any of you who is interested to know. Uh, the other unit, the business unit of Eurocrit is called ePay. It's the world's uh, largest uh, digital uh, prepaid payment uh, aggregation model. Basically what this uh, view does, it aggregates the stored value of any of the top brands and we are connected to almost 400 top brands globally. And this stored value is then dispensed either through your own channels or the franchises, third party franchises. And uh, what's the relevance of these stored value uh, points is, you go to an app store, uh, you can obviously use a credit card, debit card or any form of payment to buy the recharge codes. But what happens there are that you don't want to frequently expose your uh, form of payments on that. So what you do, you buy in bulk and then either for a self-consumption or for a gifting purpose, you then uh, use whatever you have bought. So this is a big, big business for us. Uh, we got close to 3.5 million transactions processed under this vertical in 2021. Uh, the other view of Euronet is a money transfer company. Uh, we are world's, uh, one of the largest digital remittance uh, companies connected to little less than 4 billion bank accounts. Uh, we serve almost 153 countries. On the fiscal uh, payout channels, we are connected to little less than 600,000 payout uh, networks. Net net, this is one of the largest uh, 
uh, remittance uh, infrastructures which has been built over the time uh, globally. In summary, uh, the DNA of the company is transaction processing, which we do across the businesses. And uh, as you see, the technology component which we sell to the banks is the same uh, technology which is used to power your own business. For those of you who are, who are slightly more interested in knowing about the company uh, in the brochures which you have got at registration, uh, you have a video ebook. You can you can uh, use the Google Lens or a QR code to get more uh, insights into the URL. <coughs> okay, uh, comes the meat of uh, this session, and it's the trillion dollar question: Has the cash come to a swan song? Is the self service terminals uh, not going to see a kind of growth or, or uh, future what uh, we have been uh, seeing them for last? So many of the kids. Well, the answer is no, and uh, you know I didn't need to be here to tell you. All of you uh, know this uh, inherently that even after the COVID pandemic, uh, even after the severe lockdowns and the travel restrictions caused by the COVID pandemic, which technically altered the retail uh, purchase habits, the, the buying patterns, the way we used, uh, uh, or rather, over light on the contactless mobile payments, cash has still been there. And we all know cash has got two inherent components. One is a medium of a payment on its own, and it's a store of a value. So any payment instrument, technically, if it comes close to these two features, sees a resonance, sees that option. And that's why real-time payments has come so close in a short period of time to being the kind of success it has been. Now, coming back to the pandemic, what was critical is, contrary to the transactional demand of uh, cash, or using cash as a payment medium. Cash was taken up as a precautionary demand. So people put enormous trust on the fact that if they have cash, they can withstand the onslaught of pandemic to an extent possible. And uh, this is spoon proof. And we have some data to back this up. And the most important piece is uh, CIC. I think uh, one of the speakers just spoke in, in length on this piece. Now CIC cash in circulation as a percentage of GDP is, is super critical metric in uh, trying to assess what is the relevance of our cash in a particular economy. And we all know uh, demand for currency depends technically on several macroeconomic factors, interest rates in a particular company, what the kind of law and order in that company. Uh, and then uh, while all of these things have been there, and the fact that uh, real-time payments, QR code payments grew, I just spoke to you about the fact that cash or the currency as a store of value gained eminent prominence what we did, we assessed some data across developing markets and the developed markets. So if you see, uh, and this is no surprise, you know, India or Latin America or a larger part of Southeast Asia, it grew. It grew tremendously from 2017 basis. Now the other side to pivot was, is the trend resembling across a slightly more developed market? And the answer was supremely, supremely yes. So a relevance of cash is unquestionable uh, metric in today's financial industry. So that's that's sufficiently established by this data set. And we all know, I mean, some basics. Why is cash still one of the most preferred form of payment globally? I mean, it doesn't discriminate irrespective of the gender, the age, uh, irrespective of the social status, because it's not linked to anything. It can be quickly settled. It, it's as frictionless as you can think of. You know, you give the payment, you give the cash, and the settlement happens immediately. It has a universal acceptance. It doesn't need intermediaries like schemes. It doesn't need an account. It doesn't need a cost terminal. Right. And most importantly, we spoke uh, in length and we heard uh, some of the speakers saying cash is all about trust. And then we all know in the non cash digital world, what's the kind of investments which go into ensuring that you know the cyber security and the other measures of securing this infrastructure takes. So, in a plain vanilla thing, till the time any form of payment doesn't come close the acceptability and the resonance of cash is going to stay uh, in, the, in the global economy. That brings me to the another critical aspect of, uh, you know, now we, we all know that you know, cash is not going to go anywhere. It's growing across developing market, developed market. And we also spoke about the fact that its branches are the self-service terminals, ATMs, uh, which technically uh, can get you an access to a cash. So what about the SSTs? I mean, is there a relevance of them? Is there an acceptability? Does a particular market need it? Or we are good as an economy to just ride on the fact that you know, alternate payments and, and uh, we conduct entire global commerce on the back of that. 
So what we did, uh, we, we took some data from the World Bank and analyzed the global ATM densities. And we all know ATMs, uh, and rather usage of ATMs is, is a proxy to the fact that how, how resonant the usage of cash in those countries are. And across the 20 countries, uh, you know, uh, which this data speaks about, we have a global average of 96 ATMs per 100,000 adults. Now at a global level, it probably is still super skewed. It's not what it should have been. But what makes it slightly more critical is when you see that there is a, a, there's a clear difference between how the developed economies like Latam, Southeast Asia, India included, uh, stacks up versus uh, some of the most developed economies like Canada. And if we further drill down in the Asia Pacific, uh, uh, you know, China excluded, we see we are in an enormous shortage of ATMs. Whatever be the state of uh, digitization, whatever be the state of adoption of the real-time payments or QR code or any form of contact payment, contactless payments, ATMs is critical to have a financially sustainable payment infrastructure in Southeast Asia. I mean, cash is, is super relevant still in US, in Europe, but they are not they are not handicapped the way we are. I mean, someone can come and you know counter me saying that you know we got a super smartphone penetration, we got broadband costs which are technically 30% of what it is in maybe Europe in Middle East. But the point is you have a you have a burden of getting a financial inclusion up or running, and that's something which only ATMs can do. And this is a class of uh, you know uh, population and. I can tell you this is upwards of 50, 60 percent, unbanked or underbanked. They need ATMs, and they need ATMs to have that first step towards digitization. I mean, you can't, you know, jump, you can't leapfrog a candidate from X to X plus 10. He needs to have some way of getting baptized to this. So that's that's our side. You know, you have a cash, you have a solid need of having ATMs in Southeast Asia. And that's where this entire industry will withstand the onslaughts of whatever we are seeing, the kind of challenges which were listed earlier. And I was just speaking, uh, you know, Southeast Asia, for all the kind of progress we have seen in the digital adoption of uh, alternate payments, is in utter need of, of uh, ATMs. I mean, you, you take aside Singapore, uh, whether it's Vietnam, Indonesia, Thailand, Philippines, ATMs are super critical to bridge that divide between the physical and the digital. Now, uh, we have a problem statement established that uh, the cash is not going to go anywhere, it's in fact growing. You have ATMs, which you record at any cost. So, what are we then staring at? Nothing off the curve. All of us are aware that these are some of the top six uh, challenges which, which ATMs, which large acquirers, any size of acquirers face, increasing cost. We have, uh, we have the war in new supply chain issues. There's a super shortage of the, of the raw materials because of which it is going to be, at least for the next 24 uh, months, people are saying that costs will go up. Revenues are coming down. We have, and I can tell you uh, with, with realistic confidence, every country in Southeast Asia, including if I go India, you have a super pressure on the acquiring interchange. And acquiring interchange is nothing. I mean, it's basically uh, the money which funds this entire channel. I mean, you of course have value-added services and some of the other value-added uh, transactions like PCC, but it's an acquirer interchange which funds most of the thing, uh, funds most of the economics of ATM channel. You also have surcharges. You know, leaving that aside, there is a there is a downward pressure on this whole uh, channel. The complexities are huge. I mean, whether it makes a sense, a revenue sense, if your customer segment demands something, you have to give it to them on the channel. <coughs> Whether you like it or not, a regulator or a scheme tells you to put an X mandate, you have to do it. it they might give you a you know, couple of extensions. But net net, it's the same ATM box, it's the same technology which drives it, so complexity piece is super amount. And let me not restrict the complexity to just uh, technology piece. The operational complexities we all know, you know, there are mandates on the way cash has to be carried, there are mandates on the way cash carrying vehicle has to be structured. So a lot of complexities. And then there's the security risk cyber security, man in the middle attacks, all kinds of attacks uh, which keep on coming. And then uh, for a set of banks, uh, you know, uh, 
there, there are regulations, I would say that regulations are not bank friendly, but yes, you have to go through the additional filters of putting branches. So like, uh, uh, like the domestic banks or, or some of the other banks, and there's a section of the banks which have to go to a regulator for putting up the branches every time they go out. So technically speaking, ATM still comes out to be a natural choice of extending the banking services to your customers. But some of these reasons definitely hold us back. And what has come of late, last three years, alternate payments has come big time. And you pick up any country, whether it's India, it's Thailand. And uh, I can tell you, you speak about Indonesia six months from now, you will see that, uh, you know, the likes of BI Fast, which is the real-time payment scheme for Indonesia. It would have hit ATM transactions, or I may say the cost of running an ATM channel big time. And technically, if you see, uh, you know, in, among us, all of these six factors, a common denominator is cost. You know, directly, indirectly, somewhere it's all about cost. And uh, I must congratulate, you know, for, for the adoption of real-time payments, whether it's a regulator, it's a bank, fintechs, merchants, consumers, they have done a phenomenal job. You know, as a society, we have immensely benefited. But in this whole value chain of actors, banks have a special, special place. And that place is they have to provide digital payments. They have to also maintain their ATM channels. They have to maintain all kinds of channels. Because they are supposed to be the most trusted party who can give a universal access to the payments of, of consumers, to the businesses, so on and so forth. So the role of bank is critical. And that's where this entire conundrum has to be solved. So the question is not whether ATM channel is relevant, the question is no, now moved to the fact that who is the most relevant party who can help bank to maintain ATM channels? Right. So that's where, uh, you know, we have some thoughts. Yet, you know, that, uh, uh, we have been in this business for almost 25 years and I'm not taking a sales pitch and giving our thoughts over here. It's slightly a neutral pitch and uh, I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of the industry so that uh, uh, a wider absorption to the thoughts does happen. So we, we technically see there are uh, three models which can solve the challenges, which can still ensure that a healthy ATM channel, which can still ensure banks ensure a business continuity, banks ensure a super uptime to their end consumers without compromising on the look and feel of how a typical customer will interact uh, on let's say banks channel. So a typical ATM outsourcing and it's not an outsourcing which has to be pushed to the banks, it has to be super modular, it can start with something which is the non-core to the banks you know, test it out for a couple of months, maybe a couple of quarters. If if you feel that it's working out, your customers are not getting impacted, maybe take out three more uh, uh, line items from, from your work areas and outsource it. And if you recall, Rohit had given a pretty perfect example that this business is not about three or four blocks. Every block has at least 50 sub blocks under it. And trust me, it's a super complex business. And the need of the hour is modularity, okay? We need not have revolution, we can work even with the evolution. So let every party in the ecosystem be happy in whatever they are working on. And then if uh, the confidence levels grow absolute, absolute, an entire channel outsourcing would be done. That's one. The second set of problems which uh, you know we speak to banks about is uh, they're having those you know thousands of ATMs uh, and so, you know the age of ATMs, let's say X percentage is less than three years. How do you deleverage the balance sheet today? That's a big challenge. Because it's just not about the investments you have made. It's about the investments you need a commitment. Because if you're having a channel, a set of ATMs age, you have to replace them. In some of the markets, I am also aware of the fact that, you know, a regulator has to be taken into confidence before a particular wind down of the ATM has to happen. So net net, one more option to the banks is an ATM sellout program or what we call it an ATM asset purchase program. So how does a larger ATM asset program get into, let's say, a managed services or an uh, independent ATM operator or a white label? I'll, I'll just speak uh, shortly on that. And then the third option is the white label uh, program. And here I would like to just draw an attention of the audience. In, in US, in Europe, uh, you know, regulators have been uh, uh, supportive of uh, non-banks taking over uh, the, the ATM business. And there are ISOs and there are multiple such ISOs. And thankfully, since last uh, 10 odd years, in fact, a decade back, Asia has also taken the same kind of uh, leapfrogging in getting the non banks from the ATM channel. Now, this is critical. And while in India we saw this as a white label uh, from the Reserve Bank of India long back, I'm seeing a shades of this acceptability happening in the larger Southeast Asia community. 
And that's, that's what I mean by a white label UGM program. OK, so uh, model one, which I just spoke about, uh, it's basically designed for banks who desire to rationalize their ATM operation in a step-up man manner, not in a, you know, an absolute manner. So we have, uh, let me quickly move to the next one that gives you a, yep. So if you see, uh, we are proposing to banks and uh, you know, th there is no scientific structure to it. Someone can alter these things. That any outsourcing technically can happen under four buckets. One is ATM switching. It is the most non-core or I must say peripheral activity. And when I say switching, it means handling the communication links and sending the transactions to either domestic or the Visa MasterCard gateways. A very simplistic thing. You know, hardly there is any impact on the customer of times. But at least what it ensures is, it ensures a first leg into the outsourcing model is plugged. The second one, super critical, is the ATM processing or the transaction processing, you may call it. Now, transaction processing is basically driving an ATM from an ATM software and also switching it to the respective schemes. This is definitely super critical. This is super critical. And what makes it even more complex is that if you are driving an ATM for a bank, most often than not, uh, we are going to see and ask that boss, you need to have a super hyper personalized look and feel. You should not feel that, you know, it's, it's not being run, run by the you know, bank's uh, ATM software. Then comes the ATM managed services. This is slightly an operational part, a dominantly operational part, wherein uh, aside to the switching and the technology part, your cash, your first line maintenances, your monitoring, back office dispatching, everything, else happens. And the last leg of this is the total outsourcing where even revenues are accounted for with the service provider. I mean, of course, there are multiple ways you, you, you get into the revenue arrangement. But yes, this is an absolute, absolute program where you also get and try and have an asset purchase uh, with the service provider. And this is a slightly uh, broader view of what I was speaking. And to just give you a feel, this is the kind of complexity which sits under these back boxes. So you continue to maintain all these back boxes as a bank and give us you know, some of the non-core non -core, uh, services that we maintain. In the second one, as I was uh, highlighting, you know, banks can also look for transaction processing or sourcing and continue to maintain everything. Let a conference level grow. Let the endorsement of this arrangement come from the end customer on the ground. And, and that's how the, the conference levels will grow up. This is slightly larger scope, larger gamut of services which are to be outsourced. And we are saying that you know asset management or the revenue still is with the bank. And then the last one, everything is outsourced, including the revenue drivers. Customers or the banks will just have a pay per use or whatever X uh, dollars monthly or whatever other structures mutually agreeable to both the parties, but everything under the sun is outsourced. And just summarizing the benefits, the PL benefit I just, just explained. Uh, there is no commitment uh, of, of CapEx, there is no commitment of a larger OPEX, there is no issue with the obsoleteness. So we all know, for example, Microsoft OS operating system, every three years there is a sunset. And trust me, one sunset announcement from a software provider, the entire ATM industry goes into a TV. Pick up any country, any geography, any continent, same set of problems. You get into this, your headaches are over. Right, so your PNL impacts get taken care of. Modularity, extremely, extremely critical. As I said, this has to be an exercise led by ambition, not by ambition. So one by one, banks should get in confidence and they should look up to industry players who can technically lead them in this entire journey right from the single line item outsourcing to the full outsourcing. Control location planning, you know, think of a bank who is midway in outsourcing, but they have super preferences on putting ATMs at X locations because that's where the issue strategies are. That's the catchment area where they issue bulk of their cards. So that's the acquiring strategy to acquire a competition customer. So the entire planning of how a real estate or the location of the ATMs is, is done can be mutually set up. And this is all technology-led uh, assessment. Feature-rich evolution. 
you know, banks do have their own roadmaps on technology, on channel, but think of it, when, when, a, when a player, industry player who does it for 50 other banks do it, his, his bouquet of, uh, of the features or the richness of the channel, you know, it is, it is going to be super immense. So that's the other benefit which you can immediately get from uh, such, an, uh, such an outsourcing. And as I said, uh, it, it ultimately can lead to a full bank services outsourcing uh, and then uh, banks don't have to bother about uh, maintaining anything on the ATM side. Uh, this is again an option, basically uh, a, a satellite sub-option to the first uh, outsourcing piece itself. Uh, for all the banks, uh, you know, who, who think of uh, their, their balance sheets are too heavy on the assets on the ATM side, they can uh, look up to the players who technically can buy those assets and deliverage their balance sheets. Super critical because once we deliverage the balance sheets, they can easily build their internal cases so as to not hold their capex, uh, capex for further investment. This can keep on happening. And what these banks do, of course, I mean, they don't want to be without any uh, ATM. Uh, access point to their customers, they can integrate into uh, a, a void label ATM provider if, if there is one existing in their site. Or if there is none, then even the managed services providers can run those ATMs on their behalf. So basically what would happen is the branding will still continue to be of the bank and the assets will get transferred and the managed service provider will run it on behalf of the bank. So there are multiple ways to cut the entire problem statement, but yes, there is a solution. And the last of the options, which I'm pretty sure, uh, you know, not only Asia Pacific but the wider region uh, is going to see more and more, is participation of banks in the white label uh, ATM program. And uh, this is this is super critical in the sense that, uh, you know, it, it not only will let uh, banks use that passage of selling their assets, as I said, as their absolute, uh, you know, end result. It can also give them a super coverage because if they were uh, today having 2,000 ATMs, all of a sudden they will get access to 20,000 ATMs, 30,000 ATMs as part of the virtual network. So this is something which is extremely critical. Uh, I do acknowledge that we haven't seen much of uh, the traction in Asia Pacific on this model, but given the fact that Europe and uh, you know a lot of my colleagues or industry colleagues over here will agree that some of the biggest uh, IEDs which flourished in Europe, including Euronet. Uh, you know, uh, basically uh, got the entire network built on two things. One was organic deployment of the ATMs, and second was banks would sell their assets because they find it unviable to run the ATM network when it could be done in a manner which is more uh, technology oriented, it's more financially sound. And just a summary, uh, how does an ATM network participation works? So bank can enter into a participation agreement uh, with IEDs, which provides them the access to the Full, full network which IDs have built organically or, or through the other inorganic means. Uh, there are ways to structure uh, transaction charges for your customers, you know, depending upon how the discussions stack up. You could have a full no charge to the honest customers, or you could have a super differentiated charge to the uh, you know honest customers. Uh, customers will enjoy the same look and feel. This is super critical because as white label providers, as, as uh, IDs, the technology element is super, super critical. And if you are able to demonstrate to the banks that boss, I can take care of the entire look, you know, personalization of your UI, UX, the way the touch points are around the ATMs, that definitely will give them a lot of confidence because it's all about two things. One is, as a banker, I would ensure continuity to my uh, customers. And second is, they should feel at home when they visit a particular IND's ATM network. And as I said, it's all paper use. It, it supremely, supremely relieves any retail banking uh, outfit of a bank from, you know, provisioning the kind of heavy capex opexes on a daily basis, accruing, you know, small costs, uh, which, which can uh, go as from as replacing an ATM, painting a site, changing an easy. You know, there are headaches, and there are so many headaches in this business that you can't quantify all of them. So this this technically can take care of uh, most of those issues. just put up some levers, uh, it's a non-exhaustive list, you know, how levers on both cost and revenue side add up to making uh, ATM channel a super, uh, super financially viable. You know, right from licenses, uh, which today banks uh, uh, 
uh, have from schemes, uh, you know, whatever interesting they feel. So right from those to the multi-vendor softwares, to the availability, to the agreement, to the landlord interactions, there is this whole set, and my, my ops team tells me this set is just not a 10, it's in fact 85 line item set on the cost side of running any ATM channel. And then on the revenue side, uh, you know, aside from the standard ATM uh, transactions, anything, alternate payments, standard currency conversions, as you, you mentioned, cash deposits, I mean, taking ATM as close to being a pseudo branch, I mean, that's, that's ultimately an end result for most of these banks, and IOTs are working on that path. Advertisements, uh, you know, uh, it's a big, big thing uh, in outside of Asia, but yes, uh, it's, it's catching up hopefully uh, uh, in this part of the region as well. Foreign currency dispensation, money transfers. Uh, we, we have done an extremely big uh, projects uh, out of the money transfer scheme. The fact that we have an in-house money transfer company also in Europe, we initiate uh, international cross-border money, money transfer uh, from the ATMs itself. So that's again a big, big use case. And you know, I mean, the payout uh, charges in any money transfer are in excess of uh, 150 bips, 200 bips. So that's the kind of money is either saved or uh, earned uh, from such kind of models. Bit of a uh, Euronet's own uh, experience in this business. Uh, as I said, Euronet runs one of the most versatile non-bank ATM network. It's one of the largest in Europe. Uh, we got almost 30,000 ATMs under management in 28 countries. Uh, uh, you know, a handful of recyclers. We do a lot of foreign currency dispensations. Probably in the entire Europe, uh, there will be hardly any airport where probably you would not see a Euronet uh, uh, ATMs. And a mirror of what I just spoke about, uh, we actually experience controlling the levers on the cost and enhancing them on the revenue side has given us a lot of healthy, a lot of financially viable channel. And we are a listed uh, company. You can, you can look up to our annual results over the last few you know, so many years and you will see, you know, how financially uh, this whole thing makes a transmission. We have been living this since last 15, 20 years uh, as our own network. Uh, in Asia Pack, uh, you know, the story of Euronet is almost 20 years. Uh, uh, we manage roughly 15,000 ATMs, uh, out of which almost 7,000 plus are bank branded ATMs. Uh, we provide value-added services to almost 100,000 ATMs across the region. Uh, this is one critical piece. Uh, we own the entire technology chain which runs this business. This is, this is one big thing because unlike many other players who have to rely on third parties for running a part of their technology stack, for our, uh, our own business and uh, the, the services which we sell, the entire IP ownership is with Euronet. Uh, we have four data centers in, in Asia Pack. Uh, in China, in Indonesia, in India, in Pakistan. And this is uh, over and above the fact that we provide all our services, including probably running all of these managed services through a public cloud, via a leaders permit, or uh, through some other uh, deployment options. Our managed services uh, are uh, available in all the countries uh, in this part of the world. We have got mandates to run uh, uh, independent ATM networks in a couple of countries already in Southeast Asia. And as I said, uh, we are, we are supremely confident that uh, we will see a kind of traction in this business growing more and more, uh, basically uh, mirroring the pattern of how it evolved in the US and in Europe. Some case studies, uh, my apologies, I won't be able to uh, share the name of few banks. Uh, but, uh, you know, the things which I just explained in the outsourcing model, we have actually walked and executed contracts and in the process of uh, running these networks for banks. So this is a, one of the largest Filipino bank who uh, decided that uh, their entire ATM network needs to have some kind of rationalization so that financially it doesn't uh, call for a kind of investments which they have been making since last seven years. So uh, they have deleveraged uh, part of their ATMs to Euronet and uh, Euronet has put that entire stuff as part of Euronet's network and then there are commercial arrangements where uh, whether it's their customer's experience on Euronet ATMs, it's a charge to the customer, nothing, nothing has changed. And today bank is happily sitting and uh, uh, I'm pretty sure the realizations, at least on the, on the balance sheet over a period of next five years are going to be in excess of 30% savings on this. A phenomenal and a resulting success. Uh, we are speaking to uh, three more banks, in fact the largest banks in that uh, part of the world and hopefully by the end of, of this
this year, we will have a much stronger presentation on this model. See, you have to understand, this is an alien concept. A network participation model is an alien concept in, in uh, this part of the world. We are all familiar with bank branded managed services, which in India, for example, it's called a brown label. You know, I don't know how this color coded uh, thing happened, but okay, this is called a brown label. And then we have a white label, which is slightly more uh, universally acceptable. But participating in a white label has, has not seen a kind of traction which uh, you are now uh, going to see. So that's something which uh, your net is big time counting because it ultimately is, is going to be a great proof of a win-win realization of maintaining a financially healthy and a vital channel. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I think these are fine. I just spoke to them. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, not that this is uh, some, some core to this uh, session, but this is a technology which drives this entire stack for us. Uh, this is a technology which we sell to banks, to fintechs, to merchants, to digital banks. It's called REN. Uh, we have been using it for driving our own network since last 10 years now. And, uh, you know, like the day, uh, you know, I was explaining the modularity, we have built a super modularity in, in this stack as well. And uh, for those of you who are interested in knowing uh, more about the earlier part of what I spoke or, or this new technology, I'm happy to uh, take questions now or uh, after the session. <coughs> Am I sitting between the last session and? Yeah. Are there any, any questions at this point? Please. Uh, did I hear it correct? Functions, you're saying? See, uh, a function is an output of, uh, you know, what you can build in the software. There is no limit to it. Function is an output of, let's say, if you have a super sophisticated touch screen, how many swipes you would want to have on screen. But generally what we have seen is customers, if it's not on the first screen of the ATM, they will probably not go to the second screen. So there is no limitation on the kind of functionalities you can build. In Europe, we have, in fact, uh, we have toyed with some of the super crazy functionalities. For example, if you have, uh, if you got a mail or if you got a parcel, you can technically generate a lock of that parcel in an ATM, and then you go to a blue dot and uh, insert that uh, a code to unlock the locker to get your parcel. So there is no limitation on the kind of functionalities you can build. See, uh, first of all, uh, these are super regulated networks. One, uh, you know, a central bank conducts a thorough diligence before awarding any such uh, licenses. And that diligence is conducted on multiple fronts. It's a financial uh, diligence technology, operational, uh, you know, even uh, the board fitment at times is seen. So that's one. And then once you do the entire setup, there's a, there are audits which, which happen from the local regulator. And on top of that, you have Visa, MasterCards, all regulations, whether it's on the PCI or it's, it's any regulation on the card security or for the for matter, in case of Europe, uh, DPR. Uh, you know, all of them uh, get uh, applied to IATs or white label ATM providers in the similar manner as they get applied to the banks. In fact, there are cases where the severity of such uh, enforcements is much higher than what it's to the banks.
see these uh, local level initiatives are around. So for example, uh, there's a lot of hue and cry that you know any such infrastructure should be also used for uh, societal benefit. You know, uh, whether it's enabling uh, any local municipalities to have a close user group kind of a programs, or for example, you know, raising a donations for a cause which probably might be intercontinental or very local, or, or probably as as uh, lame as putting a missing child information on the, on the screens. So, uh, as I said, technology is no limitations. It's just that you know, a wide level ATM provider or you know, whoever is managing the ATM, how do they see uh, the cost dynamics or the revenue dynamics from that particular ATM? Technology is is I mean, you can do anything possible you want with the technology. Okay. All right. Thank, Thank you very much. Uh, please join us for the cocktail sessions, which uh, I understand you're not a sponsor. Yeah, come on. Thank you.